Welcome to American Architecture Now. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest this evening is Michael Graves. Michael Graves is among the most influential architectural educators in the nation. He has been a professor of architecture at Princeton University and the center of a group of students for 18 years now. Mr. Graves has helped define Princeton's identity as a strong, self-assured school that is deeply committed to aesthetics. His architectural work, which includes residences, medical facilities, cultural facilities, and town plans, has won six design awards from Progressive Architecture and two from the AIA. Yet, he is as well known for his murals as for his buildings, and his architectural drawings have been widely praised. A warm welcome to you, Michael Graves. Thank you. It's apparent, at least to some of us, that you have rejected modern architecture as a social instrument. Your view, it seems, is that architecture communicates with individuals and not classes. That view holds that the architect is not only a technician who can solve functional problems, but also is an arbiter of taste. And it is in this role that he is called upon, in a way similar to the modern painter, to say something that is new and to propound a philosophy. I wonder if you would take a moment and describe your philosophy for us. To understand your work, what is it that we have to know? Um, that's, a long, uh, that's a long question. Uh, it's, it, it starts off with a premise that I think is not true, um, that, that maybe I would ask you to repeat. Uh, having something to do with um, uh, interested in the individual uh, in lieu of a class or the society. Um, it went something like that. Um, I would suspect that uh, any architecture is only architecture when it does both. And um, it, it is curious to me that, that there are those that think that if one attends well to one, the other can't be true. Um, but certainly in any architecture, the double reading of, of the composition has to be uh, made by the society, the culture, the individual, uh, with some degree of simultaneity. Um, so um, in, in that regard, um, I would say that, that, that uh, one's work is a reflection of that, that caring, I suppose, for, for uh, both the collective attitude and the individual attitude. Um, that's that's just a kind of rebuttal to the to that first part. What was the other? Uh. What should we know about your work to best understand it? On what philosophical base does it rest? Well, may I suggest I will talk louder for those of you who cannot hear. There are a number <coughs> of seats that are very close to the front. I'm doing the best that I can. Not. That's an other than usual response. And I am talking as, sorry. <laughs> I'll repeat Barbara Lee's questions, okay? Please do that. In fact, I have another idea. How would you like to ask the questions too? <laughs> going to try again. Right. Well, uh, Barbara Lee asked about the, 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 the problems of, of, uh, of the architect as he is regarded as someone who is an arbiter of taste. Having just read Bob Gutman's review of, of my monograph, um, evidently that notion is in the air. But I, I, um, I don't think the architect really is the arbiter of taste. I think that, that uh, in our current society, um, this kind of session uh, that we're having now has more to do with levels of taste and, and understanding than um, any one person. That, that there are obviously people out there doing work which is probably interesting, more interesting than a lot of the people you will talk to. Uh, but the fact that you've talked to some people or that, that others write about people uh, that are become known because of one thing leading to the next um, the level of understanding of those particular points of view, aesthetics, uh, take on the world, um, becomes uh, a part of 
uh, of the culture at large, it, it seems, because it becomes a part of the critical domain. Uh, it, it, it's discussed, it's, it's understood, it's denied, it's accepted, whatever. So uh, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of taste, uh, which is a difficult one anyway, um, I, I suspect that, that uh, there is a, a consciousness of taste that is held by, by the society. Uh, probably first, and as the architect fits into that and confronts that prevailing taste, uh, there is a kind of give and take. The architect, the artist, the poet, the economist, whatever, um, as, as uh, ideas become known, uh, they are assimilated. Uh, they become a part of um, the, the culture in that, in that critical debate. And in that sense, uh, there is some, some um, some shift that goes on constantly in the in the way we look at things, the way we see things. I'm avoiding taste, but but uh, if that's what you mean, I suspect that that this kind of session, more than my next house or the publication of my next building, has more to do with taste than than uh, the building itself. You talk about shift. In the past <coughs> few years, surely your own work has drifted toward an architecture that is far less abstract and that pays uh, much more attention to cultural symbolism. A few years ago, your work was generally white, rather austere, if complex, and associated through the joint publication of the book Five Architects with the work of architects such as Richard Meyer and Peter Eisenman. In the past few years, however, there seems to be much more of an emphasis to classical architecture, and your work seems now to be an unusual mix of classicism and cubism. Is, can you describe this movement and what provoked it and why it did take place? Yes, um, that's, that for me is a very interesting question because um, in, in, a, in a shift of position, which is seen by some uh, taking a building 10 years ago or 12 years ago and looking at a building now, it seems uh, to, to the layman or to somebody seeing that first object and, and a late one as if they're sort of night and day. They're, they're, they're diametrically opposed. But the shift was very, very gradual. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a, a, an enormous difference. Uh, the difference comes about, I suppose, because of, of reaction, uh, both my, my own reaction to my buildings uh, as they were built and uh, the, the readers of one's architecture, the, the, the layman, the, the client, but most of all the critics, uh, who play for me a very important role. Because I felt for a time in reading reactions to buildings that I was designing in, in uh, the 60s, that, that uh, I was not just losing readers, uh, I felt that, that in fact um, they were not reading into my abstractions, what I expected. And uh, there is a, a difficulty there in any abstract code, and of course architecture in its geometrical frame um, uh, uses the abstractions inherent in geometry, uh, and is, is very likely to, to, um, to suggest in, in the development of, of, of a given composition, or the architect starts to suggest in, in, in that abstraction, Something that, that um, for all of us, standing on the outside of that figure, that composition, something that might be very difficult to enter into in terms of a language. Um, how is the language understood when, when the surfaces are neutral? How, are, how is the language understood when the, the, the textures, the chiaroscuro, the, the idea of the building has been neutralized to the point where it's, in a sense, non-figural. Um, the, the problem with my architecture in, in the 60s, I think, though I, I was certainly uh, aware of what I was doing and the kind of, uh, of attitudes I had about it, which movement in, in a building. Uh, Nevertheless, um, people were finding them as, as gestures that were 
uh, for some readers uh, entirely too uh, formal in their dimension. In other words, um, they didn't address the, the other symbols of, of, of the culture. That, uh, that kind of problem, uh, it seems to me, is overcome to some extent if one is willing to play uh, into the abstract language, which is necessary to, to any art form, any language, uh, we have to be to some degree abstract uh, to, to say more than one thing. We cannot be have any purposeful ambiguity in our language unless there are some abstractions. But at the same time, we run the risk, uh, if we are not figurative enough, to exclude the reader in the first place. We have to have some degree of balance between what is figurative, what is associational, what is, what is understood as, uh, as symbolic uh, in terms of its figural association, and what is, is um, uh, multifaceted in, this, in the sense that the abstraction allows the, the several readers of the composition to, to read into it what they want. And so, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a kind of gradual shift to, to, uh, to attempt that equity between what is figural and uh, what is abstract. Were those uh, early white buildings meant to be colored? Um, in fact, they were. Um, and some of them are uh, colored inside. Oh. Worthy. I have a very tiny voice, and I will try to speak as loudly as I can. Well, speak to the electronics, please. I'm also fragile. Um, is there a, can one of you please see what's happening up there? Perhaps that would help. You may not be plugged in. That may be the case. <laughs> can one of you check this, please? The question is... I'll ask it again, oh, if I may, and that is... <laughs> I think perhaps you, you discovered... <laughs> you found out what the difficulty is? <laughs> Tell all. <laughs> it's your dinner plans. <laughs> the auditorium speaker system is out. They are trying to repair it now. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> We're going to start again. The question was, <laughs> were the early white buildings meant to be colored? The, the, the early white buildings. Um, <laughs> Which early white buildings? Let me ask you this question again. Uh, I had, we were talking about the drift in your work, and I asked the question, were the early white buildings meant to be colored? And you said... Well, we were... The, the five architects were, by the press, named the whites, uh, primarily because we had done uh, more neutral, abstract uh, work based on, uh, on some of the early work of Le Corbusier uh, than work that developed out of natural materials. There, there was, however, a very strong emphasis of color in, in the work of John Haydick from, from his first buildings. There was as well in mine. Uh, in the first uh, two uh, buildings that I, I built, however, um, the clients uh, felt that, that uh, the color that had been proposed was, was in a sense too much for the context. They said, you're welcome to uh, paint the inside of our buildings, uh, leave the outside alone. Um, but more importantly, at that time, there was a, a what I would regard as a kind of Neoplatonic stand that we were taking about uh, I, uh, the idea of architecture uh, being derived from general principles rather than specific ones, while the so-called Greys uh, group of, of architects um, Venturi, Moore, Stern, etc., uh, were, were seen as people who were deriving their compositions at the outset, uh, in, in, in the conception, conceptual stage at least, from a, from a kind of particular point of view. I think since that, that time that most of those two schools have, have uh, seen um, 
again, an equity between those two positions. And we're not quite as feisty about uh, being so overly general that the specific attitude of, of a local region can't play into the organization. Nor do I think that they, on the other hand, would disallow kind of the general framework of, of uh, their compositions to be more actively read. You said that you felt your public and your critics were not reading your intent before this shift in your work. Did you doubt the validity of the earlier work, or did you want to move to what you felt was closer to the mood of your time? Well, I, th I thought that even though I was convinced uh, that it should be a body apparent that, that uh, all those things that I was trying uh, should be apparent to everybody else, um, I thought it was going to be a pretty lonely world out there for me if I continued to speak what seemed to be a more or less private language. Um, and the, the privacy of my language was not what I w was interested in. In fact, being by nature a generalist, I very much wanted to be inclusive of, a, of, of, of not the mood of the society, but, but uh, the culture at large. Is there such a thing as a, an architectural spirit of a time? Is that a simplistic notion? I think it's pretty simple uh, as an idea. Um, there, there is no doubt, however, that we are uh, influenced by um, the time. Um, Miss van der Rohe uh, is quoted as saying that, that uh, architecture has to do with the will of the epoch. And um, I doubt that uh, uh, Picasso had to do with the will of the epoch. He changed the way we saw by virtue of including the way we saw in a, a new way of seeing, a new, uh, a, a new uh, series of ideas in Cubism and, and uh, other, other uh, discoveries that he made in, in the way we see. Um, and it seems to me that there is a requirement on the, the part of the artist, the architect, whomever, um, to understand uh, the, the current condition of, of the society, uh, to understand the historical uh, context, and to, uh, to uh, take another look. Well, both your architecture and your painting can stand on their own merits. They seem to <coughs> inspire one another. Could you discuss for us the relationship your painting has to your architecture? Is it a hybrid? Is it, you know, what is the interrelationship? Well, for me, um, my painting is an extension of my architecture. Um, and at least it started that way. Um, the things I was not able to do in architecture uh, because of meager bu budgets or because of particular uh, projects that one was given um, were in a way taken out in the painting. Uh, those, the ideas of, of, of the development of passage within within a very shallow space, the ideas of, of a thresholding of moving past the, the picture plane, whether it's the facade of a building or the facade of a canvas, uh, was endemic to, to both. But I felt that um, in the painting, um, where in a way I was my own client, I was able to express a, a richer dimension of, of, of that, uh, those ideas. Um, lately, however, um, the, the, uh, the work of, in both painting and architecture has come together uh, much more closely, as I, I suspect it would, uh, and had wanted it to. Not so much um, because uh, the, the, the budgets or the projects are, are uh, more generous, uh, but I suppose because I, on the other hand, am uh, more frugal with the gestures in both architecture and, and in painting. And uh, the two things are starting to meet each other uh, in more or less a head-on kind of aesthetic that, that uh, pleases me a lot. To the work of what artist do you most respond? Oh, that's very difficult. Um, I'm, I'm an avid looker and reader. Um, of, of, of everybody's work. Um, I read once that Robert Motherwell uh, felt very guilty on Sunday afternoon when he looked at his picture books. Um, I do the same thing. I, I look constantly. Um, I look and I draw. I draw what I see. And the, if I were to look at a painting of, of uh, Matisse or look at a painting of Mirandi or look at a painting of, of Montaigne, I would, I would probably end up taking uh, 
uh, archetypal conditions of, of the painting uh, to my own memory by virtue of drawing them, trying to remember by drawing. And, uh, and so I, I would find it difficult to say there's one kind of attitude uh, that, that, uh, that, or one kind of person that, that uh, I would look to. There are attitudes in painting, however, painting and architecture, <coughs> pardon me, that, that are, are uh, extremely important to me. And they have to do not so much with classical ideas as, as painting and architecture that is willing to classify. Um, one of the, the essential roles of, of painting and architecture, it seems to me, is to talk about differences, to ultimately bring the differences together in, in a single composition, but, but to suggest that there are classifications and hierarchies of elements and symbols within any given composition. And essentially those are the kind of paintings and those are the, that's the kind of architecture I tend to look at most. I was going to, I assume that you were going to mention the, some of the Cubists. I could mention the Cubists. I could mention the entire Renaissance. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing for me to say um, Gris, Picasso, um, uh, to say uh, uh, Raphael, Montaigne, uh, to say uh, Greek, Greek uh, low relief sculpture, uh, antique sculpture. Um, I can say those things, and they are the things that, that attract me, but the, the edges of those worlds are, are, are such for me that they, they tend to blur and, be, and, and meet in between, so that, that um, I really like to look at most of everything. The project that seems to, the most recent project that seems to bring together your, both your architectural and artistic concerns, is the project for a bridge, the Fargo-Moorhead Cultural Center, that links the twin cities of Fargo, North Dakota, and Moorhead, Minnesota, in a single structure that spans the Red River. That building, and I assume most people by now know about it, but I'd like to remind them that that building incorporates radio and television studios, a concert hall, historical museum, and an art museum on the span itself. I guess it's three buildings rather than one. A um, number of people have said that it is a project, a building, that shatters a lot of ideas about what a building should be like. Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis and the evolution of that design? How did you get the commission? Will it be built and when? Okay. Um, I got the commission um, by um, um, giving a lecture in, at the University of Virginia. Um, I always knew it would pay off, all that talk. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there happened to be a young man in the audience that uh, <clears throat> heard the lecture who later, who was from North Dakota, who later was asked by the city of Fargo to put together a list of a hundred architects. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they asked um, uh, this young um, architect, Roy Schieder, if he would please uh, introduce them by, by way of showing them publications, uh, the work of a hundred architects. Um, across the country, but that was only after um, uh, they had asked him uh, to summon uh, the work of the three best architects that, that uh, he knew, and, uh, um, and he said, in, in what category do you mean the three best architects, which is an interesting question, and they said, well, there's a Frenchman, uh, there's Frank Lloyd Wright, and there's a, a Scandinavian, we've forgotten his name. And I thought that was pretty good. And, One uh, out of three. <clears throat> he, uh, he said that uh, there was a problem with all three of those people. And, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> then, then the, the next uh, was uh, that they said, well, the next two or three that we know are the people that have been on the cover of Time magazine. There, you see, you strike again. And, um, and he said, who's that? And they said, uh, Ed Stone and Minoru Yamasaki. Uh, and then he did a kind of soft shoe shuffle and um, uh, said, well, maybe we ought to go to a larger list. And, and uh, um, he, uh, he suggested uh, that, that uh, he do some research and, and put together a very pluralistic list. He evidently got the list from, from a publication by Charles Jenks, who's uh, known to make lots of lists. And, um, and uh, so uh, I asked Royce at one point how he knew how he was able to develop this list of 100 architects. He said um, he took one from each camp. 
Um, I, I figured at that point we were all in trouble. Um, but anyway, uh, from that list, they, they uh, showed the work to uh, the, the clients called the task force. Uh, they selected from that a, a, a group of 20. They, let, they sent letters to the 20. And from the responses to the letter of how we would go about uh, uh, um, making a uh, composition for, for this particular place and this particular use, uh, they selected uh, four architects. Uh, they, they, they interviewed the four. Uh, the four were Charles Moore, um, Hugh Hardy, Hardy Holson and Pfeiffer, um, and Stanley Tigerman and myself. Um, we won. The, uh, the, uh, um, the project has uh, been going on now for over two years. It's a, it's a public project. It, it, um, it, is, uh, it is one that is surrounded by controversy out there. Mayors have come and gone. Uh, um, uh, various uh, funding agencies have have uh, been very, very, very uh, generous to us and to the task force. And at this point, we, after doing the kind of master plan for all three buildings, the, um, the History Museum on the Moorhead, Minnesota side has asked us to do the design development drawings, which we've just uh, last week completed. And uh, uh, presumably, uh, the working drawings will be done in the next uh, uh, eight, 10 months for Mitch that. So at least that third of it is going ahead in the next year. You mentioned earlier uh, why you had turned to painting. In this instance, you've been able to transform these masterful painterly collages into three-dimensional buildings. How close will the buildings be, will the actual buildings be to the drawings? I think drawings are drawings and buildings are buildings. Um, I think that, that um, I would um, make a, a, a suggestion that for me, um, when I draw, I draw and I, I, I draw ideas about the buildings. I certainly try to represent the ideas first. Um, the, the drawings, however, are, are uh, watercolor or prismacolor or, or graphite on paper. And therefore, they cannot be a building. They can be a representation of a building, but they don't intend to imitate reality. The same way, again, John Haydick once said when asked a question like this, I don't expect my, my buildings to imitate, uh, my drawings to imitate my buildings any more than, than the reverse. Um, that perhaps is, a, is, is going a step too far, but, but nevertheless, um, I, I think that if one can represent ideas of, of, of mass, ideas of, of uh, the polychromatic value of of uh, the light and dark, the chiaroscuro, the, the, uh, the sense of, of, of space within a drawing, and do the same in a building, and they are similar to each other, that's as much as I need. But I think there is a tradition in this country, and there is a tradition in, in architecture in general, where we see um, drawings as, not just as renderings, but as tools to buildings. And uh, there are drawings that we make that are tools to buildings. So those are our working drawings. And they are specifications. They are, are detailed um, uh, um, analytical drawings that show us exactly how to build the object. Um, but they don't try to represent ideas the same way that, that uh, a drawing might try to represent a building. Um, I'm sure that's not the answer you expected, but, but uh, it's mine. That's what I expected. <coughs> Can you uh, describe briefly your intent in that project? Yeah, um, we had originally wanted um, to uh, defuse the the, uh, the the competition between the two the two towns, Fargo and Moorhead, um, two towns that are separated by the Red River of the North. It's separated. not a very wide river, is it? No, it's not a very wide river. It's true. It does flood uh, in the spring, and it, it becomes a very wide river then. Uh, but um, but uh, the rest of the time is a very pleasant canal-like uh, in, in, its, in its dimension, a canal-like uh, body of water. Um, about half the Tiber, I think. Um, the, uh, the Red River, however, has has uh, traditionally been the boundary that, that has called up the, 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 the competition and the separations of those two states and, and uh, their, their separate identities. But because of the size of those two towns, it r was really inappropriate to, to build two cultural centers. Um, enough's enough. So uh, they did decide 
uh, that if they could come together around these facilities, uh, that that perhaps there was an architectural composition that would reduce that that uh, the sense of which belonged to which side. So I was quite conscious of that uh, that problem within uh, the two states, the two cities, uh, and those two identities. We had first wanted to. Um, as I say, diffuse that, that competition by, by uh, changing the shape of the line, the river itself, and, and in a sense damming it up so that we could make a water garden, make a, a centroid, make a, a, a place like a, a small lake uh, that would allow the buildings to surround that center and uh, so that, so that the, the cultural center would be in fact the, the pleasure garden, the, the water body of, of Fort Pleasure Craft. Uh, in the center of the river. Um, that, as a, as a formal strategy, simply wasn't possible because of structural problems of the, of the, of the soil in, in, in that region. So what we've done instead is to make a building that focuses um, on the river, both the north and the south, uh, as it, it, it spans east to west, um, that has the art museum, which is a, a kind of linear a gallery, a link between the History Museum on the Minnesota side and the Concert Hall on the Fargo side because of the, the history of those two communities uh, and, and, and their regard for those two, two parts of, of, of the program uh, and what was behind all of that. They seemed most natural, but the Art Museum was the thing that was, was uh, shared uh, by both, as both communities have art museums. We brought them together in a single span over the river. Well, that, there's, that, that technically, of course, that's not difficult. Um, the idea of a, of a kind of uh, Ponte Vecchio or a bridge building is, is uh, though the Ponte Vecchio is one of the few built ones, we know uh, from Palladio and, and others uh, the, the, the number of experiments that went on in, in, in determining buildings over bridges for similar reasons that I, I used. But it was possible uh, to focus uh, an enormous opening, um, this time an enormous window, uh, to the north for the, the uh, permanent collection of the museum, while on the southern side there is another similar window uh, which opens to the southern light uh, for a public porch uh, at an upper level of, of the bridge that looks down on the river, one, and two, to uh, the concert hall and its, its uh, adjacent amphitheater so that people can take their lunch uh, and new time concerts and, sort of, and that sort of thing, which now occur on the bridge. They close the, the street and, and have concerts on the bridge. So it's already that kind of symbol. They have chamber groups at lunch. The trucks don't like it, but, but uh, uh, the bridge would get over that, that problem. But, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, that kind of association with the, the, the shoreline or, or the, the bank and the river, uh, and, the river and then uh, the, the porch itself were a way to make a kind of uh, volume out of out of all of those things that that uh, brought us there in the first place. So, it seemed to me that the the symbol of linkage was probably as important, if not more important, than the individual pieces themselves. In addition to the cultural center, you <coughs> have designed uh, museum spaces in New Jersey as well. Perhaps you would take a moment and tell us about the what you feel the architect's role is in the making of display spaces. Well, um, I've, I've been terribly influenced by other museums. Uh, the way um, uh, objects are shown, uh, for me, uh, to best advantage, um, have to do with putting objects in, in rooms, uh, not spaces, have to do with uh, making an ambiance around the object to be shown that is, uh, that, that encourages or sponsors attitudes about that object. Not that one is making period rooms, but one can make a room uh, or give an identity to a place that would heighten or, in a sense, turn the rheostat up on the value of the artifact to be shown or the range of artifacts to be shown, rather than the neutrality that some of modern architecture seems to regard as essential to the display of certain artifacts. Uh, by contrast, the modern architect says, uh, if my walls and my rooms are neutral, in a way, the objects can be shown to best advantage. I would, I guess, take the opposite point of view and say that there is, there could be a, a, a kind of uh, debate between the, the room and the, and the artifact, 
so that, that both, in a sense, uh, become more. And have you employed that theory in the design of display spaces? Have you had that option? Um, very, very little, actually. Um, at that point in, in any project, the, the budget is usually dwindling, uh, and uh, one can only suggest. I have in the uh, Moorhead, uh, Minnesota History Museum, however, uh, described a series of rooms uh, that take a kind of, this is a, a programmatic requirement, but take a kind of linear path through the chronology of, of the culture of that landscape, land, uh, it's an agrarian-based uh, society uh, there, and, uh, and have described a series of rooms that I think will encourage that, that, uh, that uh, chronology. Uh, that isn't the case in uh, the Union County Museum, which is one of my first buildings, and uh, I, I, the, the work that I've done for the Newark Museum has been around education rather than around display space. Do you always create works of art for your own buildings? How do you mean that? Murals, interior uh, works of art. They're, they're usually offered. Um, sometimes they're accepted and sometimes not. Well, let us talk about the converse of that, and that is, uh, what is your feeling about the use of works by other artists within the spaces you have designed? How do you react to that? Well, I, occasionally uh, we've been asked to do uh, interiors, though, though um, uh, not frequently, um, but occasionally we've been asked to do uh, interiors where people do have collections. And I, uh, whether it's a modern collection or whether it's, a, whether it's an antique collection, uh, one would, I suspect, try to uh, use the same principle. Uh, and, and I have, in the, in the few times that that's been uh, open to me, uh, attempted to do that. Well, how do you feel about doing a building for a collection of works of art about which you might not be particularly fond? Um, such as? Well, I don't know the range of your taste. Well, it's pretty inclusive. So um, there would be nothing that would be excluded from that I'm trying to think. I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable question. Um, there are certain things probably that would interest me more than other things. Um, for instance, if one were making a museum of pop art uh, as against uh, a museum of artifacts bound up uh, more more um, uh, broadly based in the, in, in the culture, um, like the Moorhead Museum, um, I would probably prefer the latter, uh, because the other, to me, is somewhat singular uh, and is a, a kind of uh, art parlant. It's a word architecture that, that, uh, that isn't, for me, uh, inclusive of enough to, in a sense, develop the kind of uh, ambiance that would, would uh, I think, uh, be necessary. But if, if, if I could draw that kind of comparison, that might be fair. We've talked about collaboration here between artists and architects, and indeed we have talked about that as well. And for a moment, I wonder if you would address yourself to the state of collaboration as you see it between artists and architects. Is it possible and is it feasible? Um, <clears throat> I think both those are true. Um, and I, not simply because I, I, I like to paint, um, I don't regard myself as a painter, uh, but I do like to do it. Um, the, uh, the thing that's happening as my work is, uh, is, is more widely published uh, and more people see it, I have, I have uh, gotten responses from a number of artists who have asked to collaborate on various projects. And I am absolutely bowled over by the, in, the incredible uh, interest that, that 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 we share that between what they're doing, some people uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing, uh, and and uh, and others that that uh, that I I tend to know from other publications. I'm I have to admit um, not o overwhelmed by much of what I see in the art world, but it's interesting as as my work is published, the kinds of people that come out of the woodwork and and send me slides of their work. I think that. In time, things collaborations will be will be possible. Have you ever collaborated with an artist other than yourself? I haven't. No. Would you like to? Uh, I think we probably will will do it soon. Uh, we're we're doing a project uh, in the Northwest where 
um, by federal grant, uh, there is a, a specification for 1% of the budget. Uh, I think that's a gentleman's agreement rather than a grant. Is it? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the GSA yeah. uh, percent of construction costs right. given to right. our... That is uh, literally not I mean, any, a gentleman's agreement. Well, our clients agreed, and... Um, <laughs> no, it's the gentleman's agreement on the part of the GSA. <laughs> yes. Perhaps you'd like to discuss that project because it is your most recent one, and I think it was awarded just within the last several days. Yeah. And I assume when you talk <laughs> about the Northwest, you're talking about Portland, Oregon, and why it is so important. It's also the largest commission that you have ever received. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I have mixed feelings about it tonight because the... Uh, City Council is is uh, receiving the the determination of the jury uh, today and de debating it today. They're three hours behind us, so I'll be on the phone as soon as we leave here, but uh, to find out what happened. Um, but I'll get into that in a moment. Um, this was a shortlisted competition for what is what might be regarded as a city hall annex. It's called the Public Service Building of Portland, Oregon. Um, it's a 22 million dollar building. Uh, which essentially takes the the uh, bureaucratic services uh, and various bureaus of the of the city government uh, from uh, the kind of scattered network that they now uh, have in Portland and place them in a single building adjacent to uh, the present city hall, which is a, a fine turn of the century um, uh, Renaissance uh, American Renaissance uh, 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 building that that uh, reminds me more of of uh, the do than it does of the Renaissance, but I'm, that's what I'm told. It's Renaissance. Um, but the, uh, the the Portland building was a, a competition held between uh, Mitchell Jurgula, Arthur Erickson, and myself, and the jury um, uh, recommended our scheme. Uh, the uh, the local architects, however, in Portland, are uh, how shall I say furious. Um, uh, can they, you describe the scheme and their reaction to it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, first of all, the, the, the competition was, as I understand, organized originally or thought up originally by, by Neil Goldschmidt, who is now Secretary of Transportation. Uh, Neil Goldschmidt was then mayor of Portland. He's a young, active mayor, and he looked around him and knew, as he travels a lot, and, and knew that even though uh, Portland's uh, major office structures are, are really fine, in terms of modern architecture, uh, I, would, I, I sense that they're amongst our best. Um, he felt that there was something else going on in architecture and, and, uh, and Portland wasn't getting it. And uh, he, uh, he was worried that, this, that two major firms there would continue uh, to get the major commissions and, and in a sense more um, steel and reflective glass would be built in Portland. Though well done, he was worried that it was becoming a kind of singular aesthetic in that town. I think that's pretty perceptive. Um, so he organized, uh, before he left uh, Portland, uh, just in time, uh, the, the competition and, um, and uh, selected a, a number of citizens uh, to uh, participate uh, on the jury. He then um, um, asked uh, the, the jury to select uh, uh, an advisor who would be, in, these were all laymen, uh, an advisor who was an architect, and uh, they picked uh, uh, Johnson and Berge, and they became the, the, the advisors to the jury. Um, we, we designed a building that I presume is somewhat threatening to the, maybe those, that word is too strong, but um, it's the way I feel, I suppose, that, that is threatening to um, the, either the status quo or the, the level of, of abstraction, modernity, um, machine aesthetic, however one might see those uh, towers in, in, uh, in Portland, uh, to the extent that, that uh, the FAIA and, and uh, grand old men of Portland have joined together to, to write the city council and speak against our building and, and Philip Johnson's judgment uh, in the city council. So it's, it's gotten to be a kind of political problem at, at this point and uh, today's vote is e extremely important for us. Though we won the, the competition, um, it's likely to be, uh, to, to the, the, uh, the jury recommendation may be thrown out by, by uh, the city council, I'm not sure. Um, I say that my building is uh, perhaps threatening because um, it, as I said earlier, uh, attempts to make classifications. It attempts to suggest that the building 
has a base, and in the city, the base is, 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 is anthropomorphically understood as the kind of leg of the building, and it's, it's very different than the shaft or body of the building, which in turn uh, is different than the head or cornice or, or uh, capital of the building. And, and those distinctions, uh, anthropomorphically uh, described in, in a, a kind of mimetic aesthetic, one that, that, that uh, in a way speaks back to us, that communicates one, one way or another with us, uh, is something that gives the building an identity. Um, it's been called by the local press, my building has been labeled already, uh, it's been labeled the temple. Um, and uh, the temple design and the people's temple and, and uh, uh, that, uh, that kind of idea is uh, at, at first, um, I, I guess uh, one, would, would, one would hesitate to uh, want that to occur, but on, in reflection, I guess that's really what one is after, is that the building starts to stand for something, the start, building starts to be something, and it is no longer uh, primarily uh, 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 engaged in, in a, a kind of metaphorical similarity between itself and the machine, the kind, of, the kind of modern idiom of using the machine as the primary metaphor rather than the classical idea of man and nature. And the head of the building, the top of the building, also reflects that, that uh, programmatic uh, problem that, that we had to deal with, which was that a good third of the building was to be rented out as, as, uh, as uh, market, market rental space. And, and so that, that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a break in the building and at, uh, at the 10th floor. This is a 15-floor building. And uh, at, the, at the 10th floor, there is a, a kind of uh, head to the building that is supported by uh, the city services below. And, the, and there is some uh, literal symbolism uh, used in the building in terms of those I the idea of support and even, even the idea of the core, the structure of the building is, is represented uh, as, a, as a kind of anthropomorphic uh, language. Um, we, have, we have used our 1% art to, to, to uh, to re-describe, if you will, uh, evidently one of the few places we've been successful is to re-evaluate or re-see uh, the city symbol, which is a female symbol holding a trident in one hand and, and uh, um, a wreath of wheat in the other, uh, thereby uh, just saying something about port and land. Um, <coughs> and uh, so we've seen her again, and, um, on, and she's been uh, 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 hoisted above our, our uh, our entrance and identifies the, the primacy of entrance and, and threshold in our building. And it's not a neutral code. It's something that has um, a, a very strong language about it. And, it, and it, I suppose it speaks a little too loudly. The rheostat is turned up a little too high at this time, I suppose. But, but uh, uh, we have also evidently upset um, uh, the, the local architects by, by using uh, art, uh, again, uh, in some rather expansive garlands that uh, that are, are brought along the side of the building that give a kind of uh, traditional welcome uh, into this new garden. That's how garlands traditionally are used. You can see them on 12th Street uh, in the classical buildings. Um, <clears throat> but this too is an unorthodox kind of position and it's, it's seen as frivolous and upsetting the, the clean um, hygienic aesthetic that has been uh, uh, made the, the, the kind of uh, uh, workaday uh, idea that, that has gone on there and most other places for so long. An aesthetic that I find so incredibly alienating that I, I suppose if I were bound to do that the rest of my life, I'd rather practice law. <laughs> well, it should come as little surprise to that community because your architecture has always dramatized everyday experience. And certainly there are certain architectural elements particularly doors and points of entry that you have always emphasized. In fact, entering a building, <coughs> seem, it seems to me, has always been a ceremonial event in each of your buildings. And with that passage and through that passage, uh, a drama ensues. I've always wondered what you were trying to create with that drama, in spite of the fact that I've been engaged by it, but I wondered if it was 
the you know the purpose of the raised doorway or is it some dramatic visual connection between the sky and the building what is the intent of that ceremonial point of entry well it can be all the things that you say but uh, it comes about in my work primarily because of, of I, I suppose from the wrong point of view it's a kind of reaction that one has that a negative reaction to again <coughs> the the rather simplified code of, of, of the modern uh, threshold. Modern architecture sees space as primary. Um, um, uh, my architecture would see uh, the room as primary. And I say that and I make a difference between those two because uh, if you look at certain drawings and certain buildings by people like Mies van der Rohe or Theo van Doesburg or the De Stiel, uh <coughs> Uh, artists, uh, one sees a, a, an, an influence in our, our way of looking at the world that would see an, a, a kind of homogenous world, that, that space is, is everywhere. Of course it is, but our, our society, our culture, tends to make designations, tends to make separations from here to there outside and inside. Now, in a way, we have the technical capacity to dissolve those differences. But when we dissolve those differences, we eliminate the designation of private and public, of sacred and profane. We, 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 we dissolve and diffuse uh, the ideas that, that have given the myths and rituals of our society identity. If we say that in, in the passage through a building that there are a series of thresholds, that there are a series of doorways, if you like, or even conditions of, of, of aesthetic framing as we pass from place to place, we label, understand, identify, and under, otherwise under, uh, 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 come into contact with, with those particular places. Now, there is also, uh, if, if you include those, the idea of making a room, the idea of, of designation, of difference here to there, uh, you could also, if, the, if your palette is as wide as that, which is to say very little, uh, you could also include um, a more liberal or continuous ne ne network, a kind of hippostyle hall, a, a, a fluid de steel like arrangement. But what I, 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 in my work, try not to do is to suggest that one is better than the other. But I would say that if one is without the other, then then uh, the, the language is impoverished. And so that, that if one is making designations, one is making the wall, and that is very frightening to us in, in a sense, but if the architect it does not make walls, if the architect, in, 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 in quotes, uh, if the architect doesn't make designations, sacred to profane, inside from outside, then in a way the, the society has no use for those designations at all. But, but just as we speak to each other face to face, there is a surface between us. There is a, there is a the language is our, our way of making the window between the two of us, of, of, of connecting our differences or the debate or, or making the conversation understandable. And, and that both mimetic and verbal interchange that, that is occurring is a surface of understanding that the society must have if it's to have um, if it's to have those, those, those differences understood. Without those differences, public is private. Private is semi-private. Um, uh, and there are, are uh, no ways that we can get around uh, that, that problem of, of, of that homogenous, uh, omnipresent spatial continuity. And so, so amplifying, perhaps too much in my own work, but amplifying that that passage, that door, that window, the simple elements that the architectural um, uh, language is made of, uh, floors, ceilings, etc., and not, in a sense, running them into each other, is, is something that, that I, I care for in my work to the extent that I'm also criticized uh, because at some times uh, one, one goes too far. You've used in your writings the word, as you did this evening, the <coughs> word sacred and profane to describe spaces very frequently. Were you inferring that architecture is a kind of secular religion? No, no. Um, it's, I, I don't mean it, I mean it in the Eliadian sense, in, in that there are only designations, there are differences, there are, uh, if one sees the landscape beyond as unknown and 
and new and threatening, it is to, to us, it has always been to us, primitive in, its, in, its, uh, reg in our regard for it. If we make or idealize a place, we, in a sense, sanctify it. But we sanctify it in the sense that we give it our own identity. We, we regard our presence in it as central to it. And therefore, uh, one, one makes that, that designation from the primitive to the ideal, though those, that's not a duality often used. It's one that, that will, will uh, answer that kind of, uh, of question. <clears throat> it's quite clear that you're particularly concerned with architecture as a language of elements as well, doors and windows and moldings and so on. They seem to perform a function, but also carry with them the symbolic meaning that the culture has imbued them with. In your work, many of your projects, until this point, have been additions. And many of those buildings themselves represent a composite of fragments. The point that I am trying to make <coughs> or the question really that I'm asking is in those instances of additions, are the old houses, the original structure themselves, are they considered a fragment? Well, if one is truly dealing with a context, um, then of course what, what is there originally, uh, the landscape that that object is on, whether it's a house or a, another kind of building, uh, and the, the new addition, whether it's an adjacent building or a building across the street or, as you say, an addition, it's all a part of an historical continuum that, that one must regard what we do not as the last thing that will be done, obviously, and so it too is a, is a fragmentary condition. It, it becomes a part of the context. And uh, once the two things are built together, old and new, uh, uh, are, are still felt within any, any composition because that's part of, of uh, probably the thematic domain that, that uh, we, we see uh, certain things as representing newness as other things are representing uh, not antiquity but, but uh, values held before this new object is made which in turn may, may incorporate uh, uh, former values but it seems to me that, that uh, all of this stuff that we deal with as architects is uh, is essentially a, a continual and fragmentary kind of uh, idea that, that, uh, that, that can be suggested. Well, in the evolution of your own work, you have surely incorporated historical quotation. You've mixed elements <coughs> of the 1930s streamlined design with Beaux-Arts classicism and futurism with constructivism. And what comes out and what emerges, I guess, is an unexpected combination of the past, the present, and the future. Perhaps you could discuss a little more elaborately the notion of <coughs> fragments and your underlying structure. Is there some general formula, or is each project completely new and individual, presenting its own problems and its own solutions? No, the, the, the last suggestion is uh, that every problem has its own solution is something that one understands, though I didn't know him personally, uh, one understands was, was the basis of the work of, of, of an architect like uh, Eero Saarinen. My work is just the opposite, in, in the sense that uh, every problem is the same problem, and at the same time, every problem is a different problem, but, but there are generalities and, and particularities that, that hold from one, one, one project to the next. That's not to say that one project will look like the next, but one's attitudes don't change that dramatically uh, from one, one, uh, one scheme to, to the next. Um, there are obviously certain programmatic requirements, um, exaggerated programmatic requirements, certain functional requirements that we do fulfill that do require uh, speci uh, specific knowledge that might not be held by us generally. But that's not the norm. Uh, we find ourselves generally working within a very normal societal framework. Um, I, I tend to see my work, um, I tend to see architecture, as I said, in its classifications. The classifications for me are primarily thematic. They hold for us uh, symbolic and, and representational interests that, that uh, can be described in, in the way we would elaborate a, a sentence, the way we would elaborate an idea as having certain themes, minor and major, hierarchical themes, um, uh, themes that, that uh, are to us uh, part of the ritual of, of, of passage, if you will, if that's not too pompous, uh, from place to place, from 
from door to door, from uh, surface to surface, from plan to plan, in the in the scoring of our our work. But the the various uh, aesthetics that that you suggested were embodied in my work uh, are indeed there, and they are there not so much as as a, an effort to collage uh, those uh, various aesthetics into one inclusive composition, but that it seems to me that that uh, certain ideas uh, in each of those uh, that you mention are are uh, are regarded as as having dominance in one area or one theme as against another. And so that employing them, uh, employing the, those ideas that we know, or at least a suggestion of them, um, a, 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 a kind of take on, on certain attitudes that we regard as, as, uh, as, as public in the public domain, or the way we, we see them as a, as a culture, are employed so that I can um, liberally describe the thematic intent of, of any work. <coughs> well, perhaps the most single most important aspect of your work lies in its attitude toward nature. Your works are very clearly identifiable for their subtle and elegant colors. You assign meaning to colors that relate to nature, sky, earth, and foliage. <coughs> Use earthy colors like dark green and terracotta at the base and sky blue tones above. Could you discuss with us, please, your present attitude toward color and why representational colors are important to you? Well, um, in a way, you just you just have in that I I don't I don't attribute to the polychrome of a building the coloration of a building um, I, an overwhelming density uh, that that uh, that formal constructs can have. But that's not to say that the color is additive. But uh, in the, the labyrinth of color, there is a density um, that, that is, I suppose, beyond the individual surface of, of a given uh, plane or volume. Um, my color sense is very childlike in, in that, that the kind of description that you made can be, in a sense, believed uh, easily. Um, it doesn't try to upset the code. Um, it doesn't do that because it needs, if, if I'm to represent uh, the ground plane, let's say, not only on the ground, but somewhere else in the building, as as a new ground plane is made, very much the way this this stage is a is a raised uh, and elevated ground, uh, different from the the ground uh, of of uh, the rest of of this room. Uh, there are two ground planes in here, and one can imagine in a, a more elaborate composition how that ground. And the, the lower ground can be can be thought of, and so that so that there is not a single sort of dense terracotta, but there may be uh, a representation of a new horizontal plane, and that elaboration of that neutral plane uh, might be seen by coloring it, by by its texture, and of course, most importantly, by its position. But but without those designations, if if all of our planes are white, or all of our planes are all of our planes are one color, whatever color, gray or terracotta or what have you, uh, then it, again, it is a singular language. And it has to, it has to be a debate then only about uh, the position of that place, the, that form, and the form itself uh, within the whole composition. You, leave out, uh, you might leave out texture. You might leave out color. So if you, if you understand your aesthetic as, as inclusive, uh, then, then, uh, then you are going to one is going to question oneself about making the composition around its color code, as well as about its formal code, and as those two things uh, identify and, and uh, amplify each other, um, it seems to me that the story is simply richer. It's been said that you are lovingly and painstakingly inventing a different language of form and meaning, and that you left the postmodernists behind. I wonder if you would tell us if that was accurate and how would you describe this new vocabulary that Ada Louise Huxtable and others say that you are in the process of inventing? I don't think vocabularies are invented and I don't wake up in the morning trying to do so. Um, I, <coughs> I uh, was surprised to read that. Um, but were you pleased? No, I'm not pleased to read that. I'd just as soon uh, be regarded as other than a postmodernist 
and that's quite okay. Uh, but, but in terms of inventing a new language, first of all, I don't think art is invented. Um, but but in, in any event, uh, if there are discoveries, fine, we all discover things. But it is if one is disregarding one language and assembling a new one. And <clears throat> I, would, I, would, I would sense that, that any language is only worth its salt as, as the language is essentially accepted uh, and its meanings are accepted. And then we, in turn, uh, examine those meanings by, uh, by, by speaking the language otherwise but speaking the language, the accepted language. And so the, the changes uh, are only the kind of changes that one would experience from prose, prose to poetry. They are seeing the words or seeing the form in a slightly uh, um, a changed manner, that, that one is, is inverting uh, the language, one is uh, subverting the language, one is using the language, but you must have the language uh, to, to speak at all. So that if you can say that my base is terracotta or that, that the soffit is um, azure blue, uh, then you are, as I am, trying to speak the language. But if I, at the same time, make an inversion, I want you to be aware of the inversion, that the language has been, has been uh, and described differently. But it is our language. And it, without that language, as architects, we're finished. Do you expect the viewer to respond that way? That list maker that you referred to before, Charles Jenks, <coughs> once referred to one of, I guess, at least my favorites among your projects, the Snyderman House, is it in Fort Wayne? It was done about 1972. I think he called it a cross between a Gris and a Mondrian, a stucco box waiting to get out of a cage. Do you expect the viewer to interpret things in that kind of fashion? Well, I always expect Charles to label things, um, and and again, um, though some of his labels are are not my labels, I think it's important to attribute uh, attitudes to to and and understandings to what we see. I don't think, on the other hand, they should be simple attitudes, uh, unless the thing intends to be simple. How would you um, describe the Snyderman House? Well, about the way he did. Um, <laughs> but, um, I was in 19. 68 when that was first designed and finally finished in about 72 there's a problem inherent in those four years obviously um, I was pretty frantic um, and the building um, as seen is is uh, overzealous um, but but uh, it was one of the first times out and uh, um, and I did as as best I could um, it is a kind of uh, Neoplatonic frame, if that's what that uh, Charles means by the Mondrian, uh, and within that Neoplatonic frame, which is which is plodding and simple-minded and continuous through the whole organization, it's based on the Maison Domino of Le Corbusier. Uh, within that, there is a freer play of of uh, the surrounding and enclosing surfaces, the walls and the plan that that is engaged by those walls, that is not so much trying to to get out of that of that cage or that grid, but is in a kind of uh, debate with it, so that that one could see the neutrality of the structure against the the particularity of what I was then attributing to the various sides and conditions of the local context, the entry against the view, uh, the west light against the north light, and as as I I turned the rheostat up on those surfaces, uh, they moved relative to. Uh, the neutrality of that frame. I thought with the kind of standard language, I could then see the poetic language against it, and the contrast of the two would be worthwhile. It's one of those buildings that had very few readers. There are certain recurring themes and forms in your work. I'm thinking of in the uh, Fargo-Moorhead Cultural Center, the Keystone, in the uh, mm. Plotchik House, which is sometimes referred to as the Keystone House and the drawings that you often make, what is the significance of either that inverted or missing Keystone? Well, in the, in the, in the, in the Fargo uh, project, the, the Keystone was my attempt to use um, an architectural element that is, in a sense, the public domain, where we have uh, to our, uh, certain, certain elements are germane to, to what we do. The window is one of them, the door is one of them. Of course, 
uh, if uh, the poet uses the door or the window. Um, he's using it in a way that, that allows us to think about passage. If we use, if the poet uses the idea of the keystone as a symbol, he's obviously talking about that element, that piece of masonry uh, that's been shaped in a particular way to hold things together. And uh, it's a kind of literal symbol, but it is a way of using an architectural element symbolically. The, the keystone, because of the structural principles engaged in that building, is not pragmatically necessary. And therefore, if one uh, eliminates the pragmatic necessity in any form, you tend to heighten the symbolic interest of that form. There is a kind of uh, equity between those two in any, any object that we understand. Um, and uh, it seems to me that once I had, I had voided the keystone, made, in a sense, a window out of it, and here, here's the, the uh, Huxtable quote about the invention of a new language, is I'm, I sense that this is why she says that, that if I superimpose um, a window on a keystone, now one doesn't do that uh, in an orthodox sense, but if both are recognizable, both the window is recognizable from its mullions, and the keystone is recognizable through its uh, form, um, that superimposed, made transparent, uh, it seemed to me that <clears throat> I could heighten the value of, 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 of the identity of that center portal of the bridge. And as we stand behind that, that opening, that window, uh, that frame, and look out at the river, and in a way the landscape looks back at us, there is a, a movement that one might expect through that that veil of an architectural symbol that, that uh, is endemic to the way we think and label and, and understand our, our artifacts. And therefore, using it there uh, was, was, a, uh, was a way of heightening that, that the bringing together of those two communities. Which of your unbuilt <clears throat> buildings bring you the most pleasure? Oh my. Um, the next one. <laughs> I hope the next one will be a built one. Which of your built buildings <laughs> bring see. you the most pleasure? Um, I really don't have favorites. Um, um, it would be uh, simple to say the one I'm working on or the one that's under construction uh, because one is, is uh, constantly engaged in, in the kinds of things that, that uh, we're doing right now and, and the others seem to, to be less interesting to us. But, in my case, I guess that's not true, that, that uh, and I'm, I don't mean to be saccharine about this, but there is a kind of lesson of each, and uh, again, it sounds saccharine, but they are all one's children, and uh, I regard them as, as very important to me, uh, and, and, uh, and the interest in them, the interest that I had in them, and, and the way I see them now, as I, I re-see them, is, is a part of one's education, and therefore, I, I just couldn't do that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that, at least that hasn't happened, where, where I've, I've made something that I say, this is demonstrably better than that. I would say, however, that this is demonstrably otherwise than that, that, that they are different things, that I discover th things in one and against another, even though there are continuities, there are other discoveries. In your re-seeing them, other than your self-effacing response to the Snyderman house, are there any aspects that you would build differently now? Yeah, I think that in the uh, Snyderman house, in the Hanselman house, in the in the um, in the um, Benasserov house, that the language that I used was overly abstract. Um, it was, I think, by Jack Robertson, seen as a kind of hay thrasher in the garden in the Benasser of house, perhaps strong language uh, in his criticism of, of that building, but, but um, the, the building was a bit tumultuous. Uh, it was uh, uh, a bit strongly stated. It was, um, it was important for me to make that building, and I, at the time, didn't see it that way, but if I were to see it, if I were to put it adjacent to, to uh, buildings I'm designing now, I'm, I seem to be uh, slightly more frugal about uh, similar kinds of intentions and, and uh, the, the clarities, I think, are, are, are more apparent than they, they were then. However, in the Benasserv house, for instance, which Jack and others saw as overly abstract and, and, uh, and uh, based in, a, in an aesthetic um, uh, uh, discovered or, or, or made by, by Le Corbusier, um, 
I still have enormous interest in in uh, certain passages in, in buildings like the, the, the uh, Benazirf house and still lecture about them because uh, some of those things have not been played again uh, simply because the, the, the place hasn't been right or the, the situation hasn't been right. But no, no place else have I been able to construct a, a kind of uh, garden metaphor as, as literally and as, as abstractly uh, with that kind of equity that I did in the facade of the Benazir house. Though other parts of it perhaps aren't as, as one would have them today, uh, that particular part of it is, is still instructive to me. Is there anything that you especially like to design? Um, you mean, um, what would I, if I had my druthers, what I would rather design? No. Um, Jobs are so hard to get, you know. Uh, it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, For what would you? You, you really don't. Uh, you don't uh, look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, For what would you like best to be remembered? Uh, the whole thing. Yeah. How lasting do you think the architecture of the '70s will be? Uh, I'm have a very hard time with these kinds of questions. Um, mm -hmm. they, they seem so temporal, um, uh, and I, don't, I just don't think that way. Um, I think things that, that I've at least discovered in, in critis my own criticism of work of the 70s, or the 60s, or the 50s, when, when I was being trained, uh, as well as my own work, which I'm also a, a, a critic of, uh, become important to me uh, in regard for the next thing that I do. It's not that that's the full bias, uh, because as I've said earlier, and as your question uh, suggested, that one is interested in a in a, a, a larger frame of time. I would say, however, because I I, I didn't earlier that you said that that some of the images that I employ um, are regard the past and the present and the future. Um, I doubt that any of us use the future. Um, I I can't tell what the future will bring. I'm, and in a way, not interested in the future. Um, I don't believe in progress in art, and therefore, uh, tomorrow is the future, but tomorrow is also uh, the, simply uh, very much like today. So it's, it, for me, I, I don't try to think or second guess what it might be like uh, next year or five years from now. Uh, that kind of idea just doesn't have much for me, and, and uh, I tend to think of uh, as of my work not so much as based in, in the past either. I do think of my work as using archetypal conditions of the past and the present. Um, by, by archetypal or the archetype, I, I would try, uh, as I think is behind the, again, the Eloise Huxtable comment that, that I have, have a, a skirted or have attempted, that she thought, uh, attempted to skirt the problems of postmodernism in that one probably goes back a step further and is not using a stylistic reference, using style in this sense in the negative, though it is not a negative uh, uh, idea, uh, uh, and try to, to regard those simple elements that I talked about before as the, the primary understanding of, of, of the architectural construct rather than uh, a stylistic uh, proposition uh, after the archetype has been made. It's obvious that Michael Graves' work demands thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. It also demonstrates that buildings can do more than fulfill a special function, that they can enrich our lives. And thank you for doing so this evening, thank Michael you. Graves, and thank you for being with us today.